Hello, hello. Sorry about that uh, delayed intro. Um, no excuse. I was just totally practicing on stuff and I lost track of the time. I didn't realize it was already past nine o'clock. My bad. Uh, good morning, everybody. Y'all can hear me? I think you guys can. Um, good morning, Lee McAllister, Matt De La Hunt. No cover charge. I have a lot of friends in Australia this morning. Um, Lee was asking if I listened to uh, Infant Annihilator. We were talking about metal bands last weekend, and yes, I went on Spotify and listened to a whole bunch of weird, and YouTube, <laughs> some of those videos of the Infant Al Annihilator stuff is hilarious. Uh, Kirk R, no cover charge. Sammy Rabon, Matt Barnhart, good morning. Lee's Blue Book is ready for this. Gary Curtis, Jason Hobbs, Doug Ward, Justin Hunkin, uh, Chivalry, my man is right. Dude, I got the, the Don Rontilio beanie just for you. Is it coming up as teal or green? Anyways, let me fast forward. Scotty Smith, Pro Analog is here. Good morning. How is, how is everybody's uh, Halloween festivities? Did you guys dress up? Did I see Gabor? Gabor's here. Good morning. Super fun. Awesome. Happy time. Pedal show. Ben Coombs. Sean Walden. Lawrence Petros. Good morning. Um, it's a nice day here in, Ca in California, I wish. Nashville. Uh, it's cold, but it's uh, sunny, which is nice. Um, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah. Halloween. Did you guys have a good Halloween? I didn't... Uh, I didn't go out for Halloween, or I didn't, I didn't dress up. I always have plans to, like, dress up, and um, I never go out and buy a costume. I guess I could have gone as Henning, because um, I had that baldy cap and the glasses, but... You know, we just stayed at home, and we had trick-or-treaters for about an hour. There was probably literally six or seven parties of trick-or-treaters, and that was it. Justin Hunkin in first. Oh my gosh. Before my my buddy John Hopkins. This is a first. Oh, you know what? My freaking mouse is out. This is just awful timing. Justin Hunkin super chat. Thank you so much for that. Good morning, RJ. Thought I'd be the first to the punch. And you are. Uh, what's your top three? 10 to 15 watt amps that handle pedals really well. Been looking at a Princeton reissue. Yes. Um, you know, I don't have a lot of amps under 20 watts to tell you the truth. I probably should. Um, but a print, any kind of Princeton style would be great. Um, Morgan's, uh, I think it's the J, JS12 or something. It's basically Josh Smith's, uh, Princeton style uh, combo is a great sounding combo. I'm actually looking at getting one of those just for gigging. Um, but any kind of Princeton style combo that's out there, I mean, Fender's Princeton reissue, you can't go wrong with that. Um, maybe a Vox AC15, if you're into that type of Voxy stuff. What else? Um, yeah, just... Probably a Princeton style or maybe a Vox AC15. Good question though. And my, my, my mouse is out again. This is gonna be a problem. Hold on guys, I got it. I gotta keep on like turning it on and off. So uh, I might not be able to highlight a bunch of your comments. Uh, did I see somebody? Hold on, where are you? I see, I, I, I saw some, somebody's chat. Scotty wants to hear something. You want to hear this, Scotty, for sure? That's for you, Scotty. It's a, a um, 
belated uh, Halloween special for you. Good morning, uh, Zach from Mythos Petals. I hardly recognize ye with your um, shaven, uh, shaven facial hair. Is that so? So now that it's November, it's the the no shave Movember or whatever, whatever you call it. Are you supposed? You're supposed to technically shave on day one and not shave for the rest of the month, right? Because I saw some people that just didn't shave at all and they just looked normal. I'm like, okay, you'll just have a, a longer beard. Is that the rule? Because I obviously don't grow facial hair, so I'm not a part of that uh, elite circle. Um, oh yeah, okay, so if you're joining us, and if you're watching this on the replay, this is for the people that are watching it on the replay, if you want to jump ahead to the, all the subjects that we're going to be talking about, I'll put uh, a highlight table of contents in the description with all the timestamps so you don't have to listen to me blabbing. You can just go straight to the subject of this video or whatever other interesting things that we talk about. And I wish I had batteries uh, for my, f my, my thing. But let me do this before my battery goes out. Um, God. The heater's on first, and that's gonna be a problem. Um, Red Shell is here. Red Shell just released his uh, uh, Strymon Iridium video, people. So go check that out. I am going on my nest to turn off my heater, uh, which is, I turned that off before I started this, and I don't know why it's, unless my, unless my wife is up there turning it back on. I'd be like, no, ma'am. I'm working here. Oh, and I'm also a little bit of uh, uh, sniffly. Oh, there he is. And my, okay. John Hopkins, there you are. You're second. You weren't the first today. We had, uh, um, uh, uh, what's his face to chime in, uh, Justin chimed in first. Good morning, RJ, this is what happens when I sleep in on Saturday. I got hunkened. That's okay, it's not a competition, guys. Can you get cider and donuts in Nashville? I cannot get legit uh, Michigan cider and donuts here. It's that time of year in the D, I know. I remember going to, uh, uh, on school field trips to the, um, oh, what was the name of that cidery place? I don't know, I, I would go apple picking every fall. And the best part was the cider and the donuts. That's a lot of sugar for uh, an 80s kid to have. I might have to go upstairs. I might have to send for my, uh, my um, assistant to get me some batteries for the, my mouse. Um, but thank you so much, John Hopkins, I appreciate that. Do I have certain guitars that I only play slide with? Yes. Um, Obviously, my, my national resophonic resonators, I pretty much play slide on them 95% of the time. Um, occasionally, I'll play kind of like gypsy jazz stuff on the tricone, which sounds really great. Um, as far as electrics, I have that one white telly with the black guard that's set up for slide with the flat wounds that I, I just keep in... Um, you know, high action and, and slide tuning, so that'll be the one. But um, other than that, no, maybe one electric and then those uh, two acoustic, two resonators. So, okay, on, off. Zach from Mythos, hello, good morning. Uh, get yourself <laughs> some batteries. Um, let me see. Let me see if I can text my assistant, AKA my wife, um, if she can bring me some batteries. Can you bring me, wow, I, this, um, it says Van You Mister. Can you bring me two double A batteries? Please, my dear. See, if you say, my dear, that's usually, you know, 
guaranteed they'll uh, do it. Um, so let's see here. Uh, I got some questions here. Thank you, Zach, for Mythos Pedals. I'm just gonna leave your comment up there because my batteries aren't working. That's so weird. Oh, I hear her digging in the drawers. She doesn't have to be on camera. Um, okay, let's answer some questions and then get into the subject of this video and some other questions you may have. Uh, Gabor really likes the Barney Kessel behind me. Yeah, I'll, I might pull that out uh, later. Uh, Jason Hubbs, have I ever met a guitarist by the name of Chris Richards? He plays with Clay Walker. Um, I may have, I may not have. Um, if I did, I, I might have forgotten, but um, it's possible because I think we might have played a gig a couple of years ago with Clay. So it's possible we've met in passing or it's very likely that we have common uh, friends. Um, hello? Yeah. Hi. <laughs> She's here. Can you come here? Doesn't want you don't want to be on camera, my dear. No. Okay, hold on. Can I talk about you? Sure. No. You can go right here. There's no oh. for you. Thank you. You're welcome. Say thank you, wife. Okay, we got batteries. So, um. Let's, uh, let me, let me fix this and then I'll talk about my wife because there's something I wanted to share with you guys. And hopefully she won't get, no, nah, she won't be mad. Um, where is the top? Ooh, ooh, there we go. We in business. Woo, thank you, my dear. So. Um, I don't know if some of you may know this, if you know, if you're friends with me, obviously, um, you may know this, but my wife does, uh, voiceover work. We have two studios, my studio, and then she has her own voiceover studio on the top floor. She's got her own sound booth. I've taught her how to use Pro Tool, not Pro Tools, Logic. She knows a little bit of editing, but I do some of the uh, more advanced editing stuff for her. But um, if anyone out there is looking for very budget-friendly voice over work, may I suggest uh, using my wife's uh, Fiverr um, offer, Fiverr gig. I don't know if you guys use Fiverr, but basically people charge five bucks to do everything like people there's guitarists out there that are charging five bucks for guitar tracks or guitar lessons or something weird uh, so there's obviously artists and um, voiceover artists and my wife is one of them and if this works I'll pull up her page blad uh, so there's my beautiful wife she will record a high quality American female voiceover so if any of you guys uh, own a business um, or are looking, she's done like uh, birthday, um, like birthday videos as presents. What else? She's done commercials. She's done corporate uh, voiceovers. Um, but, yeah, you want to hear it? You want to hear? Let's see if this will play because, hello. Here. Hi, are you looking for the best broadcast quality voiceover for your business or project for an awesome price? Do you need it fast? Like less than 24 hours fast at no extra charge? Then I'm your girl. My name is Christina and I've been working as a voiceover artist and actor for 20 plus years. I work full time for my professional home recording studio. I specialize in TV and radio commercials, TV, radio. Phone, systems, phone systems, video games, character voices, podcast intros, audiobooks, real estate videos, explainer videos. I even record for music and much, much more. Yeah, so um, let me get back to me. 
So here's her. Here's the 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 website if you want to go to it. Um, but she actually recorded on my RJ and the Del Guapos record some voiceover stuff, and as well as some of my YouTube videos. If you've ever seen the videos where that are sponsored by like Dan Electro or or Source Audio or something, uh, she she does the voiceover. Like this video is sponsored by Dan Electro, um, and that's her. So if, if anyone's looking, I mean, it's five bucks. Um, uh, five bucks plus if you want some additional stuff, it's another five bucks. But I mean, five bucks, that's kind of a good deal. That's kind of cheap. I don't think I would charge five bucks for anything. Um, but it's super fast work. So if, if anyone is looking for like, you know, gr birthday greetings, anniversary greetings, or if you're working on videos yourself, if anyone is a YouTuber out there that wants some cool uh, voiceover stuff, um, like intro or like how I do my, this video is sponsored by Spiel. Um, yeah, go hit her up. Um, I told her if she gets more gigs from this, then she owes me, but that's it. Fiverr.com slash Christina with a K underscore VO. Check it out. Let's see what you guys are talking about. Are you talking shit about me? Um, was, uh, where, where, where are we at? Where are we at? Red Shull, Mythos Pedals, you should have her VO a pedal demo. Hey, I haven't had her VO a whole pedal demo. Um, if you, if you write the copy, she'll do it. Or if you want me to help you write the copy or whatever. Let's do it. And if you don't do it, I'll probably do it. Ooh. Who's going to be the first to have a professional voiceover on their, on their, uh, gear demos? Hmm. Um, uh, anyways, what was I, what else I was going to talking about? I made a list of things to talk about. Uh, where are we at here? 919. Okay, um, one more thing. NAM plans. Have you guys been making your, whoever's going to NAM, um, have you made plans? Because I just booked my flights uh, yesterday. So it's set. Um, I think it's the same deal as the past couple years where I come in a couple days early and I leave. Uh, that Sunday. So I don't stay for the entire NAM show. And in fact, I might only go for two days. I might do it because like for some reason last year I got so tired, uh, maybe from all the traveling and just, you know, it's a, it's a tiring event, but, um, what was I going to say? Yeah. My, I kind of had a strategy. Like if I go th the first day, Thursday, skip Friday and just kind of have a day off and just recharge and then go Saturday. That might, that's usually cool. I think two days is enough for me to enjoy it, possibly. Um, three days sometimes seems a little bit too long. Four days for sure, oh my God. If I, the last time I went Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, it's like Sunday I didn't want to be there. It's crazy. Truth Street, I should give her five bucks for the batteries. Uh, already did. Um, Rhett has a place booked but no flights. That's kind of how I was. I had my hotel booked uh, a couple months ago just so I had that price locked in because, you know, the closer you get to it, hotels get so expensive or they get sold out. So always hotels are the first things to go. And then the flight, I think my flight... Uh, was round trip was like three three hundred and thirty bucks or something round trip so it wasn't too bad um southwest is the best so that's what i'm doing and i got some uh stuff that i'm filming earlier that week um so i will be there early Actually, I've got a lot of extracurricular stuff that I've planned that it, that's not happening at the NAM show. But if you are at the NAM show, I can tell you Saturday I'm supposed to be playing at the Guild booth, which is going to be upstairs, I think. Um, so if you want to make plans to see me on Saturday, 
at some point, probably in the afternoon, um, I'll be at the guild booth one day. Um, is it ever, is it ever too early to talk about winter nam? Nah. Um, for the battery fund and for Krista, <laughs> sitting in the MKS. Thank you so much for that. That's I really appreciate that. I'm sure Christina appreciates that. Pr appreciates that. Uh, maybe I'll take her out for lunch. Maybe I'll take her out for a steak dinner. She's a saint. Um, ben Coombs is flying United. Hey, United, you know. Because you live in Canada. Isn't there like a, a nice Canadian carrier that'll... Or like Alaska Air or something? Uh, am I flying into LAX? No. That's like... The first rule of thumb when I, that I learned uh, when flying to Nam is unless you have, you know what? I do have business in LA that, um, earlier in that week and I'm still not flying into LAX. I'm flying into Orange County just because it's such a, it's worth the drive and the traffic to me to just um, land in Orange County. It's just so chill. LAX, um, is a very crowded place and gives me anxiety. When I land in Orange County or like Burbank or Long Beach Airport, I can like have a, it's a good start to the trip. Um, but then I have to drive to uh, LA anyways, which is fine. It just made sense to, cause I'm flying out of Orange County. So I might as well fly in and fly out of the same place. Uh, get my rental car at the same place, so. Um, if you can, I mean, you know, if, if you want to fly to LAX and you have stuff to do in LA, obviously, then go for it. I can tell you from living in LA and flying out of all the different airports, um, Long Beach, if you're going to NAM, Long Beach and Orange County, I would say, are the best, if you can. It's an extra, fl it's an extra flight. Obviously, there's not a lot of direct flights to the, the smaller airports, but sometimes it's just only a little more expensive and it's, it's kind of worth it to me. Um, Truth Street, when is NAM? Uh, it's the week of January 14, 15, I think the 16th is the first day of NAM, the Thursday. Okay, Marcus Rogers, thank you so much. Where'd you go? I just saw you. Super chat. Ooh, I got that 420. Thank you so much. Oh, did you, does anyone uh, appreciate this shirt? Anyone? Uh, anyone seen um, Miami Connection? One of the greatest kung fu movies. It's actually not a kung fu movie. It's uh, Taekwondo. Uh, thank you. Marcus, um, thoughts on 65 blackface, 65 blackface tweed, 68 silverface, 68 silverface limited. Oh, wow. Are we talking about, what champ are we talking about? Uh, deluxes? Are we talking about limited uh, and... Uh, you know what? I don't have any deluxe reverbs or deluxe amps anymore. I used to have a blackface deluxe reverb. Uh, they're all good. I mean, even the silver faces, you can find a really nice one. Um, black faces are great. The reissues are great. Um, the Tone Master. Uh, I actually have a, a Tone Master coming in the mail next week. Uh, and I played one at the, the Fender showroom here in Nashville. And I think we were talking about this last weekend, but they are really, they are really, um, stepping it up with the technology. It's, you know, one of those amps that, um, the Tone Master is, uh, it's an amp that can get that feel of an actual tubed uh, deluxe reverb. And for my money, or, you know, I, obviously there's a difference. You can hear a little bit of a sonic difference if you can, if you're a stickler for that stuff. But is it a difference that make, like a bad, in a bad way, is it a different, thing and really no it's not um 
the uh, the weight of the amp is awesome if you're gigging a lot. Um, Rhett Show likes the Tone Master, so if Rhett likes it, um, no, but check it out. It's kind of like, I mean, for me, nothing beats a real tube amp, but if you want something that you don't have to retube or worry about it getting hot or the weight, um, or if you're you want something for gigging, check out the Tone Master because I would totally gig with that over a, a tubed uh, deluxe. Um, and the reverb, you know, it's like a digital reverb. It sounds great. It doesn't sound like exactly like the spring reverb, um, but it sounds almost like a studio quality style thing. It's really nice and hi-fi. Um, okay, shall we talk about stuff? So the, the subject, where are we at? Okay, right around 9.30. The subject I wanted to talk about today is, I got a lot of questions regarding how I go, you know, from different gigs, different styles, um, kind of like a jack of all trades type of thing. And, you know, I've... You've seen my channel, you've seen some of the videos. I, I'll play blues, I'll play jazz, metal, rock, funk, R&B, why am I doing this? Uh, reggae, world music, Latin music. Um, and I, you know, first of all, you have to enjoy playing those styles. You can't just say like, I wanna be a, a well-rounded musician so I want to learn every single style. I mean, you genu genuinely have to enjoy listening to old R&B or, you know, roots reggae or salsa music. And that's something that I think that, um, that kind of helped me was just like really appreciating those styles of music. Obviously, obviously there's styles that I can't play or haven't really, um, spent the time to learn, um, like, like bluegrass. I enjoy a little bit of bluegrass, but that's a, a, a certain style that I, like if you asked me to do a bluegrass gig, I would probably say uh, I'm not the right guy for it just because I can kind of fake things, but it's not going to be a legit sound. It's not gonna be, I'm, I'll be a poser. And you know, that happens. But there's, you know, other styles, I mean, Flamenco. Flamenco is totally over, not over my head because I do enjoy listening to flamenco, but, and I was going to talk about this in a video. Is this light, light bothering you? Do I need to move this way a little bit? Um, that looks cool. That's very red. <clears throat> flamenco is a certain, not only a certain style, but it's a certain technique that unless you're really trained and really learn that technique, specific technique, um, you can't play flamenco. You can't play flamenco with a pick. Um, you can't play flamenco with a normal classical guitar. I mean, you can, but it's not gonna be the same. There's a certain, certain equipment that you need for flamenco. There's, you need nails, you need uh, certain techniques. Um, so, obviously I can't play every single style but the styles that I can play, I really did delve deep into those styles. So um, one of the tips that I, I tell people is, is if you wanna play, or if you wanna start learning different styles is to just listen as much as you can to all the repertoire. And um, we have it great now because what before, you know, before the internet, I had to listen to records, I had to listen to um, CDs and everything, and I didn't, I could hear what they were playing, but I couldn't see how they were playing it or, you know, really, um, you know, see how they were attacking things, if they were playing with a pick or if they are playing with their fingers or a finger pick. Now, er there's everything on YouTube. There's videos of every single guitar player out there. So, um, it's even easier for you to, like, really delve deep and kind of nerd out on people's styles or different types of music. So like if you wanted to, if you said, I wanna become a better funk guitarist. For me, I would have had to listen to like 
James Brown and Funkadelic Records and Prince Records, now you can get on YouTube and see who the guitarist was playing with with James Brown at this certain period or who the guitar players in Parliament Funkadelic were or um, see how Prince was actually, you know, doing his right hand on some of those funky rhythms. So now it's great because it's like lesson, lesson videos everywhere. Um, so we are lucky today. Um, but <clears throat> when you learn a different style, you not only do you want to listen to all the, all the different um, songs, but you kind of want to, at least for me, I like to go all the way back to the beginning of that style. And I think I've, I've talked about this before. Um, for instance, if, if you're going to learn blues, say you're like a Stevie Ray Vaughan fan and you want to learn how to play blues like Stevie Ray Vaughan. Um, not only should you listen to Stevie Ray Vaughan, but you should listen to, you know, Albert King, Freddie King, um, all the stuff that kind of influenced him. But even before that, and basically you want to go back all the way to Robert Johnson, Sunhouse, and Charlie Patton, if you want to become a well-rounded blues player. And blues, I mean, blues is a thing that, like, there's so many different facets to the blues. There's so many different styles within the blues. You've got Texas blues. You've got Chicago blues. You've got West Coast blues. Um, and there's different styles to the shuffle. There's a certain Texas shuffle as opposed to a Chicago style shuffle. So there's so many <clears throat> intricacies. Is that, the, is that the word I'm looking for? Um, Todd Pippi, I see that super chat. Thank you so much, buddy. Uh, Atomic Fireballs or Leningrads? Which candy rules? Um, I don't think I've had, ever had Leningrads. That sounds really hot, though. I would say Atomic Fireballs. Um, I've got a lot of leftover candy, by the way. Um, so, back to the blues. If you're going to learn a style, kind of go back to the beginning of that style and really learn where it came from because you're going to learn how these, how Clapton play, you know, what influenced Clapton and what influenced John Mayer. <clears throat> so I like to listen to as much as possible and kind of go back in the history of that style. Um, transcribing solos, that's a big big deal. People are always saying like, why don't you just develop your own style or why don't you, um, why, are you, why are you trying to get Josh Smith's tone? Why don't you work on your own tone or stuff like that. And to tell you the truth, every single guitar player is influenced by another guitar player. That's how, you know, we've developed. That's how it is. You can't just not listen to music and then become a guitar player and, and have a style. It's, it's, I don't think it's possible. I don't know, maybe you can, but it'd be, it would sound weird. Um, so I think it's very important to, to learn people's styles. And, and sometimes that involves uh, transcribing solos, if you can. If not, then maybe get the tabs. But um, many guitar teachers will tell you that um, if you can transcribe somebody's solo on your own without looking at tablature or, or sheet music that's better for you because it's training your ear you'll learn um, the solo or whatever you're transcribing a lot better you'll learn kind of the the details and the dynamics of how they're playing it because you, you keep on playing it over and over again to to learn whatever phrases or whatever notes so transcribing solos that's a big that's a big part of learning a certain style for me um Let's see. I mean, I've, I've transcribed a bunch of jazz solos, some blues solos. Um, the metal stuff, I think I probably, depending on how hard it is, I, I'll probably just try to find tab online or like in books or magazines just so I don't have to worry about it. Like the fast stuff. Like I've bought books, Steve Vai books, Eric Johnson tab books, Ingve Malmsteen tab books. And back in the day, if... If anyone is uh, around my age, we used to have Guitar for the pra Practicing Musician magazines 
which is how we learn songs and how we learn solos. Give me a thumbs up if you were an 80s kid or a teenager and you learned from guitar from the pack for the practicing musician, which I have a bunch of them in the other room. I should have brought them out to show you guys. Um, repertoire, yeah. Um, each genre I feel has kind of standards, standard repertoire. Obviously jazz music has standards that you need to learn. All the things you are, autumn leaves, stuff like that, the basics. Um, blues has standards. You should know how to play a B.B. King style blues or um, an Albert King style blues or Stevie Ray Vaughan kind of Texas Shuffle style blues style licks. Learn the actual songs, learn the actual licks. Um, that kind of helps you get well-rounded with the style. Um, and just knowing, I mean, R&B, I spent many years in South Florida playing with club date bands, wedding bands, however you want to call them. What do they call them in LA? Like corporate bands, um, ca is it called casuals in LA? Casual gigs, basically cover band stuff. So I had to learn a bunch of classic R&B songs as well as the new, newer modern stuff. Um, and that's great practice. Um, cause it, you, you're, you're kind of forced to learn that stuff and you're playing it. So you want to make it sound good. So, um, learn the repertoire, learn kind of standard phrases, for instance, you know, am I on? this says, this is not the tone, but so you have, if you want to play a BB King style blues, you have to learn that lick and certain phrases and certain licks and kind of keep them in your your bag of tricks bag of licks um, so learn the vocabulary of the style um, I'm trying to think of some, some other examples country there's you know chicken picking stuff <laughs> that stuff all this signature kind of phrases or like stereotypical phrases it's just stuff that you kind of learn from okay what's when I think of a country song what's the what's the song I think of and then kind of learn the guitar parts of that song or if I um, when I think of a punk rock song what's the first song I think of and then that learn that song kind of like what defines that style or what defines that genre and kind of learn that stuff yeah exactly Lawrence the BB box um, I'm going to keep on talking. I'm not really looking at the comments section yet. Uh, okay, now I am. Um, and what was I going to say? Um, and so go going back to when I was playing with different cover bands and stuff, that in itself was a big part and big help in learning these styles just because <clears throat> you're gigging maybe four hours, four or five hours a night, every week and uh, you're just playing these songs over and over again and then the repetitiveness really gets a it really gets it in your brain but since you're playing with other musicians that are also kind of on the same page with you um, playing the style and really um, you know playing it the way it should be <clears throat> that's going to help you learn how to play that style. So for me, for instance, um, I'm kind of going off on a tangent, but um, so when I was touring with a reggae band, so I learned how to play reggae from Jamaican reggae musicians. I learned how to play R&B music from playing with R&B musicians. Um, so getting together with um, other musicians that, that know this style better than you is going to help you, obviously. Um, when I lived in Miami, I didn't know how to play Latin music or Latin pop music, but as soon as I started getting these gigs and um, really um, those musicians are the ones that helped me understand, okay, this is a Montuno, this is the feel, this is, <clears throat> this is the, um, 
this is how you have to feel this certain rhythm. Same with, same with reggae. Um, when I started rehearsing with Inner Circle, um, it was almost like, I think, I, you wait for validation from the other musicians. At least for me, I remember playing, you know, just simple stuff. And the bass player, Ian, would tell me, no, don't do it that way, do it like this way. Or the other guitar player, Roger, would say, it's more like this feel. So they actually told me, like if you play reggae like this, well, that's ska, but with upstrokes, you're doing it wrong. It's like a heavily subdivided downstroke. It's almost like I'm thinking. That's how my I'm visualizing my right hand to be, but it's actually I'm only attacking the strings on the upbeats. So um, playing with other musicians definitely helps. Playing, being on gigs, if you can be on gigs, um, that definitely, definitely helps. Um, so I'm thankful that I was able to play with such great Latin musicians in Miami and, and reggae musicians and R&B musicians. Um, rock musicians. When I lived in LA and I was in a rock band, um, another thing I wanted to point out was when you play it authentic with these groups of musicians, yeah, you, yes, you learn the style a little bit better, but you also learn the way it, the music grooves. You know, the music has a certain kind of um, attitude. Uh, especially, so with reggae, um, I feel like the best way to learn reggae is to actually play it with the band. Because if you play it with a backing track, you're going to lose the, f you're not going to have the feel. Um, there's a certain lazy feel with reggae. There's a certain laid back kind of feel that you can only get with the right drummer and the bass player. Um, so you really kind of learn the, the groove of of that genre or the, the, the personality or the attitude. Like you're playing in a punk band, you can't play with a backing track. You have to play with a loud, obnoxious drummer uh, in a small rehearsal studio space. <clears throat> and wear your guitar low and play punk rock music and, and play all downstrokes. You know, you have to. You can't do this. That's cheating. So there's an attitude that goes along with all these different genres of music that you have to learn to make it legit or else you might be a poser. So I think that's important is to really feel the music and kind of put yourself in that headspace of, hey, I'm playing reggae, smoke a spliff. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but, you know, kind of feel it. Really feel it. Um, another trick I have is visualization. So if I'm playing, if I'm hooked up here, I've got like an 80s metal guitar. I've got a, I've got a distorted amp. Tune down to E flat. Obviously I'm going to play some Eddie Van Halen stuff. Um, but I'll think about it and I'll be like, okay, so what would... Like, if you saw my, the video I just posted of the Crazy Tube Circuits uh, Cyclone Phaser, I, I opened up that video with like an Eddie Van Halen-esque uh, jam. It wasn't, an, it wasn't eruption, even though it kind of hinted at eruption. And I got a lot of comments saying, oh, that's so cool. It's, 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 it sounds just like Eddie. But to tell you the truth, I was, I was kind of like pulling things of like, what would... How would I play my version of Eruption? And what are like certain Eddie licks or style or patterns that he would play? And obviously, I mean, I did like, what did I, I played, I don't have the right tone, maybe. I mean, that's just like a, a random uh, tapping thing. 
Um, what else did I do? Something like that. Something like that just reminds me of what would Eddie do? What would Eddie play? Or... That seems like something Eddie-ish, even though it's not what he played on Eruption exactly, note for note. Um, so thinking of like, what would Eddie do or what would what would BB play, or what would Ingve do? You know, like here's a very Ingve lick that I play all the time. Um, and that's kind of like I just learned those licks to have uh, something in my my bag of licks, like. Play an Ingve lick, and that's like okay. Here's my Ingve lick that I'll I'll play all the time. So kind of think of like what would a certain player, what would he play or she play, and think of like their a signature lick or a couple signature licks of their of their style. Um, that's another thing to do. Kind of visualize you being that player. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to touch on is gear. Gear makes a big difference with me being comfortable with a certain style. Um, for instance, this rig, this sound, this sound, I'd be totally comfortable with on a rock gig. I've actually played this on country gigs. I play, I play this guitar at the Grand Old Opry. I don't know if you saw, I had a, a, a vlog a couple of years ago where I'm playing at the Grand Old Opry and I brought this guitar and it's awesome. <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, so yeah, this, this is the only Charvel Jakey Lee that's probably graced the stage of the Grand Old Opry uh, and I'm proud of that. But um, like, I don't think I would take this on like a, a blues gig necessarily. Let's see. I mean, I could. Yeah, I would. Let's face it, I would take this freaking guitar on every single gig I could. I mean, but that's kind of the nature of this guitar. It's kind of a Strat, it's kind of a Super Strat, right? So it is um, usable across everything, and I need to tighten this. But, I mean, on the other end of the spectrum, if I had this, technically I could use this on any gig, but the way this is set up right now, I have uh, flat wound 12s on here. Can you even hear that? It's so low, low output. There's a little bit of overdrive. And my, I would, um, so this is my jazz guitar. I'm, I haven't uh, put lighter strings on. This could be a blues guitar if I had lighter strings on it, but these are 12s, I mean, and flat wound. So I have a flat wound third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. So I can't do a lot of bending stuff. I hope you guys can hear that because I'm just hearing it acoustically. I can't really hear it through my speakers right now. Um, but with that being said, I would also change my pick. So right now, this is kind of like my go-to pick. Can you see? Can you see that? Uh, the Dunlop Flow uh, 0.88 mil. Uh, that's kind of been my all-around pick that I could... Ah, and I just lost it. Um, that I feel like I could take on any gig. But with this guitar, I would want something a little bit heavier. So I might switch to my uber expensive um, Hawk Picks, which is like 2 mil, uh, kind of more tortoise shell. Oh, where'd you go? There you are. Because that's more comfortable for me and comfortable for the style. And it's, it's a good match. So I kind of have 
you know, obviously I have um, a ton of different instruments and a ton of different amps and, and pedals and whatnot, but a, a reason for that is because certain gear combinations make me play a certain way. Um, and it helps me feel that style. So like if I was doing a classic country gig or any kind of, like as soon as I pick up this guitar, like this, I have to play country music. I mean, I can play other stuff with it, but if I was gonna play a country gig or chicken picking thing, I would probably take my green pick again. <laughs> I immediately start chicken picking when I pick up a Telecaster with a, a maple neck. That's just the rules for some reason. And inversely, or additionally, my, my uh, custom shop Tele with the rosewood fingerboard, I start playing Chicago blues on it just because it's, I think of Mike Bloomfield or for some reason or Steve Cropper or something. So I don't gravitate towards th that guitar for country as much as I do with this for some reason. And it's a visual thing. It's probably like just a, uh, an attitude thing. It's a vibe thing. It just looks the part, so I'm going to, to play the part. That's kind of how it works. Um, so having the right gear, I think, um, for me at least, I don't know about you guys, let me know in the comments, does gear play a part? in the way you play as, as far as different styles. Um, let's talk about that. Because like, Les Pauls, let's, let's take Les Pauls for instance. Everyone sees a Les Paul pretty much as a, a rock guitar, blues guitar, for the most part, right? But if you, think, if you think about it, the Les Paul started as a jazz guitar, which you don't see a lot of jazz cats playing Les Pauls anymore. Which is interesting. That's I've, that's always fascinated me. How I guess that could be said with any guitar, really. Um, but yeah, Les Pauls started as a jazz guitar, and now is a rock guitar. Go figure. Um, Painkiller. Do I always match my hat with the color of my pick? This hat. I don't know if the color is coming in right. I don't think it matches this, does it? Nah, this is more green. This is more blue. But this, the, the Rontilio is, how about this? Uh, no, that's still blue too. I think this actually matches my, my cell phone cover. Ooh, look at this guy. Look at all these colors. Um, Let's see, Gabor agrees with me. Thank you, Gabor. <laughs> Mythos, Zach always plays SRV-esque stuff when he plays a Strat. That's cool. Um, I probably play Hendrixy stuff when I pick up a Strat. Um, Tor R R Rydberg, Rydberg, I thought the Les Paul just started as an electric guitar. Yeah, you're right. I mean, same with the Stratocaster, same with the Esquire. Um, but if we think about, well, Les Paul, he was kind of a, a jazz guy. Or, I don't know, how would you explain Les Paul's early stuff? I mean, <clears throat> back then, pop music was jazz, so you could say it was, it's a pop guitar. All right, maybe, maybe I, I, well, let's not get into that. That's a whole can of worms. Um, Ben Coombs, I use certain gear for certain styles, like a flatter radius fretboard for fast, heavy stuff. Yeah, you're right. So the telly, maybe that's another reason. So that telly, this has a seven and a quarter, you probably can't see, seven and a quarter radius on this uh, fingerboard. Whereas the, the white one has a flatter radius. I think it's like nine and a half probably. So it's a little more modernized. So that makes me play a certain way. And you're right, Ben, a uh, flatter radius makes me shred more. Um, Matt Elder, good. Here, I'm gonna highlight your uh, little uh, gear guitars in particular, give me a vibe and push me in different directions. 
based on what feels right with that instrument. I guess they help me achieve an alternate internal state. You're right. It's same for me. Um, Rockabilly, for instance. Um, for the longest time, I did not own a Gretsch guitar. And I, if you've seen that old Sweetwater video where I went to Gear... What was it called? I don't want to say Gear Fest. Is it Gear Fest? Whatever, the Sweetwater gear thing that they do every summer. Uh, and I bought the Gretsch Eddie Cochran. And, I mean, I can play jazz on that thing. It's great. I can play blues and rock, but it sounds amazing and it feels amazing for rockabilly stuff. And I've never had... I've had some guitars that I used for rockabilly. Um, like a, I had a Duesenberg. Um, I still have it. The Star Player, which is a great guitar. And it kind of did a rockabilly thing, but it wasn't the same. Um, what else was I using? You could play rockabilly on a Telecaster or a Stratocaster or a Les Paul, but there's something about having that Bigsby and that size of the hollow body and the way that the, the fingerboard feels that just screams rockabilly guitar. So yeah, I agree. Uh, Gabor says, I think Les Paul hated the pickups that ended up in Les Paul's. Didn't he end up using the LP recording because of the low impedance pickups? Uh, I think so. That's what I heard. I forget the story about what happened with those pickups or what McCarty was doing and all that stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, the funny thing is, I don't know how it worked with Gibson back in the day, but the, the Barney Kessel sign signature guitar, Barney Kessel hated it. He never played it. They just literally had this, um, from what I heard, they had this design laying around and they said, hey, do you want to slap your name on it? And he said, yeah. Or you want to slap your name on it and we'll give you money. And Barney Kessel said, sure. But there, I think there's one picture of him in an ad with this guitar. But he never played that guitar. He had he had a, like a 175, an ES-175 with a Charlie Christian pickup, which is what I had in college. Um, it might have not have been a 175. It might have been like an like a L5 or something. I can't remember. The, the cutaway was a little bit rounder. Um, but yeah, um, I feel like Gibson was just, at the time, was just kind of putting out signature models just to you know, just to sell stuff, but the actual people weren't approving of, of the uh, designs necessarily. Um, which is different now, but back in the day when they were start, you know, they were just starting and getting more commercial. Uh, Painkiller, what made me pick the Eddie Cochran signature model over all the other Gretches? Uh, yes, it does have to do with the pickup configuration. Um, you know, I, I've played many Gretches and nothing ever resonated with me. There was one time, I think I've told this story, where I went to Chicago Music Exchange when I was living there, and I played every single Gretsch that they had, which is a lot, and um, I didn't like them. I don't know what it was. It might have been the way that they were set up, or it could have been just the pickups. I mean, I do like Filtertron pickups for some stuff, but to me, they're kind of like a one-trick pony. Um, and with the Eddie Cochran, you've got the P90. It's in the case, I should have brought it out. You've got the dog ear P90 in the neck, and then you've got the uh, D'Armond in the bridge. And every single pickup position, you know, the neck, the middle position, and the bridge position, they, they all sound amazing. Um, and they're, they're single coil pickups, so you're not going to get, you're going to get a little of hum, but I kind of like that. Um, but that's a great combination, a P90 and then the D'Armond the um, is an excellent, it's kind of, and it's like not a very typical combination, but for some reason it works. Um, and that guitar is just great. It feels great. Um, maybe, I, maybe I got a good one. Cause I've played some where the Bigsby wasn't staying in tune, but this one, maybe it's set up perfectly so the Bigsby stays in tune and that, that's what I like. Same with this, this mastery stays in tune, which is a big part of what, why I like a guitar. Um, 
Bam is saying Les Paul also played SGs, which is technically a Les Paul model, right? <clears throat> it wasn't that he disliked the SG, so asked for his name to be removed. It was because he didn't want Mary to get... Oh, wow. Politics. He didn't want Mary to get more money after the divorce. <laughs> wow. I didn't know that. Uh, Mary Ford obviously was the singer that Les Paul worked with that he was married to. Um, I'm not plugged in. You guys want to hear this? This one? Oh. Oh. Um. And now with this guitar, I don't know what to, I can, I don't know what to play with this guitar. So, this screams a lot of things to me. This screams I could play blues. I could play surf. I could play like high energy rock. Um, I guess I could play metal on this. Let's start. Not exactly the best. Uh, my buddy Tom Strelly's here. Good morning, RJ. Hey, if, if anyone has never followed or seen Tom Strelly's videos, I'll, I'll put you up here, Tom. Um, Tom is a good friend from LA that I've met, that I've known for probably over 10 years. Um, he's got a great channel. Go follow him. He just posted a video uh, regarding 10 tips to improve your speed. Um, and we talked about some really cool things. I left a comment saying that, um, like most people, I was really into the thick Jazz 3 picks to play faster. Uh, then I got into, you know, um, like gravity picks and V picks. These hawk picks, which I still like to use, which are very thick and don't bend. <clears throat> but recently, and I think I've told you guys that I started experimenting with lighter picks, probably um, because Paul Gilbert uses lighter picks and he shreds. Um, so I started experimenting with like uh, 0.73 millimeters. This is a this is the Jazz 3XL, which actually I really really like, uh, but I wanted to go a little bit heavier, and the flows are perfect for me right now. The thing what I, that I've found about lighter picks is they feel great to me for shredding. Uh, let's go back to this view. Because you have that scraping action and for some reason that's important to me. And I think Paul Gilbert talks about it. That scraping feel, it's very intuitive when you're playing. It's, it's like giving you feedback from the string. It's like... Um, you know, you can feel the string vibrating when, when you pluck the string. Whereas you, if, if you have a thick pick, you don't feel anything. It's just like, you know, a solid piece of something just passing through the string. With this, you can actually get feedback and feel the string. But with thin picks, they make my hand tired if I'm playing a lot of fast stuff. And then you, you kind of don't have the same volume uh, as a thicker pick, like I can get more volume out of a thicker pick. With this, it's, it's not as loud, and if I want to make it louder, I have to dig in more, and that's probably what makes my hand tired. But the green, the green one and the blue one is what I'm kind of experimenting with. One's one millimeter, this is 0.7, no, 0.8. Um, it's kind of like right in the middle of those two things. Uh, the blue one is obviously a little bit, little bit stiffer. But for some reason, the green one feels the best to me, so... I'm kind of torn between the green one and the blue one right now. But yeah, great video. Go to Tom's channel. Uh, 
he's a great teacher. He's got great lesson videos. Uh, whether you're a beginner or a intermediate. And Tom, I didn't know you could shred that fast. I was watching that video. I'm like, dang, Tom. Um, where are you, Tom? I like the Herco Nylon U2 pick for blues soloing. Yeah, um, and it kind of depends on the style. If I know I'm going to play like traditional blues, I will take a nod, I will take a tip from Guthrie Trap and Tom Bukovac and just use like a, a Fender Heavy with the butt side turned. So I'm using the, 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 the butt side of the pick. I won't be able to shred intricate stuff with that, but there's a tone, there's a fat tone and feel to, to using it that way. I don't have one of those around here. Not that you'd be really able to hear. Down here. And here. So this is kind of like a standard celluloid pick, right? So what Guthrie and Bukovac will do is they'll turn it around and, and use it this way. Can you see that? So instead of the long part, the pointiest part, they'll turn it to the side and use that. And it kind of has this... <laughs> Round, I want to say the feel is rounder than the actual tone, but you kind of... Here's the pointy part. Here's the butt part. So it's a little bit rounder, it's like rolling off the highs, basically. Um, thank you, Ernie Flanagan, Stingray Bassman, Nashville, Tennessee. Appreciate it. You're a neighbor. So having that the the rounder edge kind of helps you slip between strings, which is really nice. But if I was trying to play something fast and I would get lost. Here's the pointy edge. Hear the difference? So, um, where did I see a comment? Uh, a, a, another friend of mine uh, from Miami, Aaron Libos, who's an amazing jazz guitar player, uh, was asking on Facebook what people were using for picks, and someone made a comment that um, Jim Hall, who's a jazz gu guitar player, um, was known for switching picks in the middle of a song. So if he wanted a more bassy part, he might use a different pick, like a felt pick or something, or a thicker pick, and then when he was soloing, he might use a different pick and, and crazy stuff. That's pretty intricate. I don't know if I would... Actually, I've done that before. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. When I was on tour with um, with Thompson Square, the country band, um, I would use my normal pick, right, which was the, the white um, Tortex T3, Dunlop T3, as my normal pick. But there was a certain, the solo that I would play that I have yet to teach you guys had a really fast passages in it and like a lot of sweet picking that I couldn't nail consistently with this pick live. So I would actually switch to a sharper pick. Like, um, I think it was a, I think it was a V pick. It was like a V pick switchblade, which is like super, super sharp. Like you could probably break skin with it, um, which I don't have, but that would actually help me play those lines better. That's not the pick. But the line was like, uh, how's it got? And then it ended like something like that, but I couldn't nail it with this pick. Obviously, I couldn't nail it then. But when I switched it to the sharper switchblade pick, I was able to do it more consistently. So I would do that uh, live, like on a gig, switch between picks in a song. That's like really anal retentive though. 
Um, did I see Robert Baker's here? Robert Baker, yo. Are you here? Or am I just, am I just uh, talking to nobody? Anyway, if Robert Baker's here, uh, I think he's got a new um, course coming out pretty soon, which is, what is it, four and a half hours of uh, material? That's a lot of work, man. I commend you. I haven't even begun to start my next course, which I don't even... Uh, okay, so Spot MFD, can you do a, a Udemy lesson on improvising? Uh, yes. That's kind of what my next pl my plan for the next course is kind of how I approach soloing, like over blues and stuff, because um, I have a weird, unique approach to soloing and whatever. So I figure I'd teach it to you. I, it might not be on Udemy. I, I might uh, just have it for sale on my website. Um, because that way, I don't think I will incur any fees. And I've got a great new website that can uh, house courses and I need to take advantage of it. So uh, I got to get to work on outlining it, but it'll be coming probably next year. Steve from Boston is here. Um, I have a secret to tell you guys. Uh, Monday I'll be releasing probably the best video I've ever done uh, and it was from 42 Gear Street, and it was with my friend, Steve from Boston, and Jay Leonard J, and we had a good time. That's all I'm going to tell you, but I will tell you it was the most fun I've ever had making a video. Um, it's awesome. Steve, you haven't seen it, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, I'll send you a link after this. It's great. It came out really, really good. So check it out Monday. It's probably the best video I've ever done. We've ever done. It's, it was a lot of fun. Um, Tim Allen, hello from an, uh, a Detroit bass player. I, I, I literally know three people from Detroit named Tim Allen. Obviously, you, the bass player. Tim Allen, f Tool Time, uh, Home Improvement Tim Allen, obviously. I say obviously a lot, don't I? Uh, and then my first guitar teacher, his name was Tim Allen. Wait a second. Timothy Allen... Are you the bass player that played with the Chisel Brothers, Timothy Allen? <clears throat> I can't I can't tell by the the picture. Let me know because my my first teacher I think was named Tim Allen. It was Tim, I can I think it was Allen, but he was a bass player. He played with the Chisel Brothers. He taught at Fiddler's Fiddler's um is that you? He taught at Fiddler's Music on Mac, and he was my first guitar teacher. No, I'm not. Okay, I was just checking. That would have been funny if, it, if you were my first guitar teacher. Oh my god, I would freak out. Um, so yeah, my first guitar teacher was named Tim, um, and he taught me um, the basics. He taught me out of the Mel Bay Blue Book, and this was in the 80s, and we were in this small little lesson room, and he would just like chain smoke and chain smoke, and I'd... I'd come home smelling like smoke, and my mom would be like, why do you smell like smoke? I was like nine. Yeah, I was smoking the camels. No, but um, <coughs> Mel Bay Blue Book, that's how I learned how to play guitar. <laughs> Ernie lived in Chicago too. That's awesome. I miss Chicago. I don't miss it right now, because I'm sure it's cold as hell. But, um, Josias Mazepa. Did I say that right? Josias. Greetings from Argentina. Love your content. Thank you. I love Argentina. Uh, do you like to use compressors? So my thing with compressors is... I used to use it uh, all the time for, like, my clean sound. But now I only use it before my overdrives or distortion pedals for a little bit more sustain. Um, for soloing, but that's really the only time I use compressors now. Um, occasionally, if I'm doing something where it's like really spanky funk stuff, or it needs to be a clean sound that has to stay super level, like a very loopy type part I'm playing, I'll use a compressor on a clean part, on a clean sound, but usually I just use it as a sustain pedal before my overdrives. Glenn Harris likes my jammies. Thank you. 
this uh, Old Navy. You can't go wrong. Did anyone mention, I know I mentioned uh, my shirt. Did anyone say they watched Miami Connection before? This is a very red shirt. I like it. Um, Steve is building the strength to rake leaves today. Ooh, how cold is it over there in Boston there, Steve? Uh, Jason Lindholm is near Chicago, and yeah, it's cold. Well, I lived in Chicago for two winters. We moved there in the winter, so I had that winter. We stayed another winter, and then we left that summer. Because I couldn't take it. So yeah, I uh, I hope it doesn't get blizzardy this year in Chicago because that's uh, absolutely the worst. Steve says I'm matching the guitar. If I'm matching the brightness, it's very vibrant on my screen. It's probably vibrant where you're watching right now. Need a heavier pick already. Another thing about picks, if I'm going to be doing a lot of uh, picking down by the bridge where the tension of the string is a lot stiffer, I will make sure I use a heavier pick because or else you're going to be breaking picks. Like if I use this 7.7 whatever 3 millimeter compared to a 1 millimeter more volume doesn't wear down my hands so much. That's another benefit of having a thicker pick, I, I guess. Anyways, uh, pedals. I got uh, Josh Smith's Love Pedal Chula into a JHS Pink Panther for that slap into the Sir PT100. <laughs> That is a, a neglected key for guitars. F for blues. Let's put this. Oh, yeah. Hey, Michael Ross. Uh, Michael Ross, my good buddy, uh, who wrote the article on me uh, in Guitar Player. Uh, am I going to see Robin later? So Robin Ford is playing at the five spot tonight. Well, 6 p.m. Early bird show for us uh, old people, which is great. Uh, I don't know. It depends how I feel. If there's tickets, um, <laughs> I was looking at like the bands in town app just to see who was playing. And I was like, okay, Robin Ford's playing tonight, but Guar is playing on Monday, so should I save my money and just see Guar? And I'm like, wow, that's two totally different um, musical interests of mine. Robin Ford or Guar? I don't know, let's take a poll. Should I see Robin Ford tonight or Guar on Monday? <clears throat> Uh, yeah. F is practically required if you're playing with brass or B-flat. You're right, Steve. I like it. And I, you know, just use a, um, a, a capo. I like to, um, who does this? Like, Jimmy Vaughn will do this. A lot of blues players will just capo up and just play in the open E position. Okay, let's see. Zach says myth, uh, Robin Ford. Robin Ford. Steve Guar featuring Robin Ford. <laughs> I would pay double to see that. 
Uh, my knees hurt. Ask your wife to work a devil shift and go see both shows. Um, Doug Nichols is going to see Michael Cleveland, 12-time uh, IBMA, which is in International Bluegrass Music Association. Fid is that right? Fiddler of the Year. Uh, Gwar, Robin Ford, Gwarb, Gwarb, Robin Gwarb, uh, Tom is saying F Robin Ford, Gwar, Gwar after show party. It's two separate days, so I could see both of them, but I didn't want to spend the money. I've seen Robin Ford. I saw, uh, me and Michael Ross saw Robin at the, the Rudy's Jazz Club last year, right? John Oz, I had my ribs broken at a, at Guar back in the 90s. <laughs> so you can't get your ribs broken at a Robin Ford concert, guys. You also don't get like a, like my friends from high school went to see Guar. I didn't go to this show, but they still have their white t-shirts um, that they got spewed all over, you know, with like the, the multicolored spew. I think that was a thing. You you wear a white t-shirt to a guar show and then you, you get like a free tie-dyed shirt because they spray stuff on you. Um, Larry Real says, Bonamassa's in town in KC. Um, my niece heard, dude, I need to hear about that PV amp behind me. What PV amp? I don't see a PV amp. Do you see a PV amp? The PV amp way, way back there that, can you really see that? It's my Backstage 50. That's like my first amp I ever had from the 80s. Um, hello, Edwin Crane. Good to see you. Um, I'm going to answer a couple more questions. It's, uh, five more minutes and then I got to run. Reverend Bozo Wolf went to Odorous's funeral. Wow. I didn't, uh, I didn't, wow, that's cool. Um, I think um, one of my friends in Chicago saw one of the last shows that Odorous played. <clears throat> um, let's see here, Robin Ford, Robin Ford. Okay, we'll see. Robin, you know what? I've never been to the five spot. Can you believe that? He's playing at 6 p.m., right? If I'm not mistaken. So I feel like they're letting the old guy play at 6 p.m. and then they'll open up at like 8.30 for all the hipster stuff. played at the five spot I, I really needed to get out of the house I kind of worked my ass off this week I did like four videos which is a lot for me so I'm kind of I think I'm gonna take today off for for once I don't have I mean obviously I have videos to do but I think I can let them go until Monday should I take the day off guys please say yes <laughs> SD Robinette, good question. Skeleton finger slide, who makes it? Uh, so if you've been look, seeing any of my old videos, I have a, uh, actually I have two slides with a, a finger bone painted on it, but I bought that original, is the black one with the, the three bones is porcelain. And I bought that from Big Heart, is it Big Heart? Yeah, Big Heart Slides at a NAMM show in 2000 and, ooh, 2005? 2005, I think. Um, and that was a custom one-off, I think. Uh, I don't think he really makes it. You might be able to ask him if he'll make one, but I haven't seen anyone else with it, so I'm definitely keeping it. And then I had uh, Diamond uh, Bottlenecks uh, make me one um, out of glass, which I also have. 
<clears throat> Steve from Boston, I shot one video. I'm taking the week off. <laughs> My man, Steve. I can't wait for you guys to see this video on Monday. Um, I deserve a break today. Thank you. Tommy Duke, have I met or played with Marcus King? No, I haven't, but I'm a really big fan of his. Uh, Matt Dillahunt, would I play ever play happy birthday to a fan? Yes, I would. Let me know if I need to. Uh, Al is saying take tomorrow off too. Football won't watch itself. I am not the biggest football fan. I'll watch it occasionally, and I'll watch the Super Bowl occasionally, but... Um, I don't know. I can't get into it anymore. Before it was cool, you know, you just kind of spend the day watching games after game, Sunday and Monday, but I felt kind of lazy, and it's kind of like a slow-moving sport to me. To me. I don't do... I mean, I have friends that do the whole fantasy thing and are really into it, but I, I watch it now and then. But I don't follow, and I don't do the fantasy stuff. Um, down by down by the river. Oh, I like that name. Just got the Ariel Posen slide. Uh, I need to get that, and I always think that Carter Vintage is going to have one, but they don't have it. They're always out, so um, I would love to try it out. I feel like it might be a little bit too thin for my liking, because I like the thick, thick glass slides. Um, but I would try it. Um, uh, did I miss something? Okay, uh, Gabor is going to bed. Good night. Uh, I'll see you uh, later this week somewhere online. Would I get demonetized for happy birthday? I don't think so, because I, I think happy birthday is public domain. <laughs> I've never done this on uh, in this key. all I could muster up this morning. All right, guys, uh, I'm going to take off. It's uh, 1030. It's a beautiful day here. I hope it's a beautiful day or an evening or afternoon, wherever you're at. Thank you guys so much for joining. Thank you for all my super chatters uh, that sent me uh, lunch money, battery fundage. Uh, remember, if you guys need voiceovers, hit hit my wife, Christina, up. There's the uh, the address. Fiverr.com slash Christina underscore VO. She does amazing voiceover work for very cheap. Um, so get on that if you need stuff for your work or if you know someone that needs voiceovers for videos or commercials or kind of um, answering systems for their businesses, offices, hit her up. And if you ask politely, maybe I'll put some original uh, backing music uh, on it as well. Um... So, that's it. My knees hurt. Just woke up. You just missed it, so you're going to have to watch the replay. <laughs> Take care, Ben. Thank you so much. Uh, make sure, Ben, I think if you're all moved in, are you going to have your, uh, your live stream tomorrow? Uh, let everyone know if you're doing your live stream, Ben, because I know you just moved. Um, let's see here. Matt Harrison, thank you so much for joining me and, being, and moderating. Um, Painkiller. Phil Mosley, Joe McCarthy, Sean Walden, um, have a great weekend. I'm going to take the day off for once, get out, get some sunshine. Uh, can she do voiceovers that sound like the guy from Shawshank Redemption? Uh, maybe not for $5, but maybe for like 100 bucks. yeah. We can work on that. Uh, thanks, Barry. Thank you guys for joining me. Um, that's all I have to say. I'm not going to try to sell you my merchandise because you can just go to the Teespring link. Um, but enjoy the rest of your weekend. I'll see you guys. Uh, remember Monday, I've got a really cool video coming out that I'm excited to show you guys. Uh, and I'll see you probably on Monday. All right, guys. Have a good one. Bye.